The last two years have made it a challenge to go out and share the good news. That's why it's important that we take the necessary steps to spread the gospel again. Today, we join Pastor Lemming as he challenges us to get back to the mission. I'm going to do something this morning that I never, ever do, and that is I'm going to ask you to keep your Bible in your lap and to just give me your undivided attention for the next few minutes. We're going to look at a number of different scriptures. I'm going to read them to you, the portions of them uh, that I want you to hear, and I encourage you to write down the references that I give you, and I do hope that you'll go home and that you'll look these up and find out if what I'm saying is in fact the truth. And I, I want to be today painfully simple. Uh, I'm going to be painfully simple. Some of you are going to think, we already know that, Pastor. We already understand what you're telling us. But you don't know how many people I meet on a regular, consistent basis who don't know what I'm going to be telling you today. And I'm going to be answering that question, why? Why do we have to go back to the mission? You know, the last 18 months, uh, last, uh, you know, almost 24 months, we have been working at the mission, but it's been very difficult. It's been very difficult for our ministry partners. It's been very difficult for us as well. But we as a congregation have got to go back to what is the heartbeat of our church, and that is taking the gospel of Jesus to our local community and taking the gospel of Jesus to the ends of the earth. We don't do one or the other. We do both and at the same time. And we do that locally through our own church ministry. We do that internationally through our missionary partners. These flags represent a few of the countries where we have missionaries, uh, some 35 or so countries where we have missionaries that are serving the Lord on our behalf. But we have to remember why we do this. If you don't know why, then you don't understand the emphasis, you don't understand the push, you don't understand why it's so important to get back to the mission. And so I'm going to be just bluntly uh, simple today as we think about it. You know, there's some questions that are asked of us as we're children, grow, as, from our children as they're growing up, that are sometimes difficult to answer. And they're those questions, why? Some of you are raising your children now and you're hearing that question, what, a hundred times a week? Why? Why, mom? Why, dad? And some of those questions are sort of difficult to answer. For instance, why do we park on driveways and drive on parkways? You ever thought about that? Or why is abbreviated such a long word? Think about that for a moment. Or one that I like, why is lemon juice made with artificial flavor and dishwashing liquid made with real lemons? You ever ask any of those kinds of questions? Or why is the time of day with the slowest traffic called rush hour? Think about that. Or why is it called lipstick if you can still move your lips? <laughs> Ladies, you'll have to try to answer that one for us. I hope there aren't too many men in the room that can answer that. Or, or why do they call it a TV set when you only get one? It's not a set. It's one TV. Or Here's one that I have, you know, have personal knowledge of. Why do you press harder on a remote control when you know the battery's dead? <laughs> You've done it. Uh, you, I, I know this is going to change the channel, but you know the battery's dead. You know, there's some questions that are hard to answer, aren't there? There's some questions that our children ask us uh, along the course of them growing up and the expanding of their knowledge and their understanding that are difficult to answer. But this question about why we have to get back to missions is really painfully simple. And it's laid out for us in a number of different ways in the Scripture. The first is because there's a commission from above. There's a commission from above. The dictionary defines commission as the act of granting certain powers or the authority to carry out a particular task or duty. It goes on, to charge with a task or the authority granted to a person or organization to act as an agent for another. There is a commission from above. There is one who has the authority, who has granted that authority to his church, 
and intends for his church to carry out this responsibility, to carry out this task. God could have written the gospel in the skies above. He could cause the stones to cry out and speak on his behalf, proclaiming the gospel. But he has chosen to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ through the commission he has given to the church of the living God. Just before Jesus would ascend back to heaven, after his crucifixion and his resurrection, he called his disciples together and he gave them what we commonly refer to as the Great Commission. Listen to a part of it, Matthew 28, verses 16 to 20. Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And, lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. That's commonly referred to as the Great Commission. It's great because the person who gave it is great. It's great because the gospel we are proclaiming is great. It's great because the task that has to be accomplished is a great task. But this commission is the authority that comes from Jesus Christ and has been granted specifically to his church. That is you and me, not buildings, not properties, but to you and me, for the purpose of taking, taking the gospel so that we can make disciples of all of the nations of the earth. Did you know that there are today about 7.9 billion people in the world? I can't even comprehend that number. I can't even fully understand uh, the, 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 the hugeness of that number. I Googled it here just to see what the most recent statistics are. And if you do that, it'll bring you up to a little clock that shows you a number of how many people are in the world. And over here on this side of the clock, you can watch it spin. Sort of like when you go outside and all the power in your house is on, all the lights are on, all the utilities, you know, running everything in your house. And you're watching that power meter and it's just spinning like this. And you're knowing how much you're going to have to pay. You watch that meter and it's just spinning like this, ever constantly adding people to the number of people who are coming into this world. Can you guess what's 750,000 miles long? It reaches around the world 30 times and it grows by a minimum of 20 miles every day. Do you know what that would be? That's the line of people that are without Christ or without a faithful gospel witness to Christ. Can you imagine being born in a part of the world where there is the darkness of religion, but there is no knowledge of the light of Jesus Christ? Can you imagine what it would be like to live in that part of the world, to have been born in that part of the world? The gospel is everywhere in America. We ignore it many times, but it is everywhere in America. But around the world, there are so many places that don't know the truth that Jesus has come to set them free. And the church of the Lord Jesus Christ has been commissioned. The authority that was given to Jesus Christ has been granted to you and to me to take that message on his behalf to as many people as we can possibly reach with the love of Jesus Christ. But secondly, we have to get back to the mission because there's a cry from beneath not only is there a commission from above, but there's a cry from beneath. One of the most startling scriptures to me is found in the Gospel of Luke chapter 16. It begins in verse 19 and goes through verse 31. And in that particular section of scripture, Jesus tells the story of two men. One is a rich man, the other is a poor man. We only have the name of one, the name of the poor man, Lazarus. The rich man is is wealthy, has everything that he wants in life, but he's not right with God. The poor man has to eat the crumbs, the leftovers from the table, but he's right with God and he knows God. And the Bible says that both these men die. In hell, it talks about the rich man, that he lifts up his eyes, being in torment. Stop and think about what it says in that passage about hell. Not only is it a place of torment, it's a place of separation. 
There's a great gulf that's fixed between him and paradise, and he can't cross that gulf. He'll never be able to get out of the place where he is. It's a place of unsatisfied desires. He longs for just one drop of water to be placed on his parched tongue, but it never comes. It's a place of hopelessness. No matter how long he's there, there is never any hope of ever escaping from that place of torment or that place of punishment. It's a place of remembering what could have been but will never be. The opportunities that were placed before him, but he never seized those opportunities and followed the opportunity to be made right with God. It's a place where there are vile companions, vile companions. Listen to what it says, Revelation 21, verse 8, about the lake of fire. But the cowardly, unbelieving, abominable, murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. I mean, when you read through that passage, if it doesn't shake you on the inside, something is wrong with the way you're reading. Because Jesus is telling that those who don't know Jesus Christ, who aren't right with God through Jesus Christ, are separated from God forever to be punished in a place called hell. It's interesting that that rich man who didn't know God and who finds himself in hell, if you listen to him, you hear him crying out in prayer to God. He's not crying out in prayer to God that God would release him from that place. He's crying out and he's praying for his own brothers that are still alive and praying that somebody would take the message to them before it's eternally too late for them. He doesn't pray for them to join the church. He doesn't pray for his brothers to be baptized. He doesn't pray for his brothers to live a good life. Do you know what he prays? Luke chapter 16, verse 30. He prays that his brothers will repent that they'll have a change of mind about where they're going and what they're doing and understand that Jesus Christ is the only way. And this man in hell is crying out in prayer, wanting someone to take the good news to his own brothers so that his brothers wouldn't come to that horrible place. If I could roll back the, the way of eternity and let you see into hell today, you would hear not only them crying from the pain and the torment of the suffering that they didn't have to endure had they only been made right with God through Jesus, you would hear them calling out, please, someone, send somebody to keep my loved ones and friends from coming to this place. William Booth, who was the founder of the Salvation Army, said that if he had his way, he wouldn't send his missionaries to seminary to be trained in theology. He said that if he had his way, he would have them spend five minutes in hell. He said after that, they, after they'd been in hell for five minutes, he believed that they would be motivated and moved to go out into the streets and the highways and the byways and warn people of this place called hell. But we've come, become so used to and so comfortable with our Christian surroundings that we forget that people who die without Jesus are separated from God forever even those who have never once heard the gospel of Jesus Christ. And there is a cry from beneath. When Billy Graham conducted his first London crusade, he preached on the subject of hell. And after the message, there was a man that came to him and he said, Dr. Graham, if I really believed in a place as terrible as hell, I would crawl on my hands and knees over broken glass to warn people not to come to that terrible place. And may I suggest to you that those people who are in hell today would gladly crawl on hands and knees across broken glass to be able to warn their loved ones and their friends and their neighbors and the rest of the world, you don't want to come here. There's a commission from above. There's a cry from beneath. But we have to get back to, 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 the, to the mission because there is a compulsion from within. There's a compulsion from within in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 14 and 15, this is what the Apostle Paul says. For the love of Christ compels us. The love of Christ compels us. Because we judge that if one died for all, then all died, and he died for all. First of all, I love that phrase, he died for all. 
There isn't anyone that's left out of the saving plan of God. It doesn't mean here that because he died for all, that all are saved. It means that because he died for all, all are savable. He has made it possible for anyone to come to faith in the Lord Jesus if they just hear the message of the gospel. But notice what motivates the Apostle Paul. He says it's the love of Christ that compels him. The word compel means to control or to restrain. It means to urge or to impel. And please notice what he says that, com- that, that, that is the compulsion for him to keep doing the work of the ministry. It isn't the great teaching of Christ. Obviously, the teaching of Christ is great. It wasn't the great example of Jesus. Obviously, the example of Jesus was great. It wasn't the great ministry of Christ, caring for the broken and reaching out to those who were hurting though Jesus did all of those things. And it wasn't the great life that Christ lived, the perfect sinless life that he lived. What was it that motivated the Apostle Paul? It was something deep within him that had been shed abroad in his heart, and that is the love of Christ. Actually, the picture is that of a horse that doesn't, you don't want your horse to be distracted by the things that are going on out in the periphery. And so you put blinders on that horse so that the horse runs straight forward and isn't distracted by the things that are going on around. And Paul says, I don't want to be distracted by anything else in this world. I, 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 am, I am compelled, I am impelled to move forward and to carry the gospel of Jesus because of the love that Jesus has given to me. Think about the love that you've experienced, friend. I mean, if you don't feel a sense within yourself of the love of Christ compelling you to take the message to others who need it, then something has seriously gone wrong in your own heart. There's something that is missing from deep within you. Something has distracted you from what's most important. The Apostle John said it this way, Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called the children of God. Don't you think of it that way? What the, the, the manner of love, this incredible love, what manner of love he's bestowed on us. How can we who have that love not feel compelled to share that love with others? One of my favorite stories, it's an old story, but one of my favorite missionary stories is a story about Maria Dyer. Maria was born in 1837 on the mission field where her parents were pioneer missionaries in China. Both of her parents died when Maria was just a little girl, and she had to be sent home to England to be raised by one of her uncles. But she never lost her heart, that inner compulsion of the love of Christ to take the gospel to the Chinese people. At the age of 16, along with her sister, she returned to China to work in a girls' school as a missionary herself. And five years later, Maria met one of the most famous missionaries, one of the most famous missionary biographies you could ever read. She met and she married a man by the name of Hudson Taylor. Hudson and Maria's work was often criticized. There were those that were even Christians that criticized the work that they were doing. And at one point, Maria wrote, as to the harsh judgments of the world or the more painful misunderstandings of Christian brethren, I generally feel that the best plan is to go on with our work and leave God to vindicate our cause. And that was wise, wasn't it? Of her nine children, only four of her children survived to adulthood, and Maria herself would succumb to to, uh, cholera at the age of 43. And yet she was compelled by the love of Jesus Christ to go to a part of the world where God was calling her to give the message of the gospel, even though it would ultimately cost her her life. And on her grave marker are the words that... Uh, are these words that are inscribed, for her to live was Christ and to die was gain. Do you get the picture? Why are we involved in missions? Why is it so important that we get back to the mission? Why is it so important that we have missionaries and we partner with missionaries? Why is it that we reach out to our own, com- our own community? Because there's a commission from above because there's a cry from beneath, because there's a compulsion from within, but fourthly, because there's a call from beyond. There's a call from beyond. 
When the Apostle Paul was traveling in his second missions journey, he was going from one place to another. And in Acts chapter 16, verses 8 to 10, he tells us about something that occurred. We often refer to it as the Macedonian vision, but listen to what it says. So passing by Mysia, they came down to Troas, and a vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia stood and pleaded with him, saying, come over to Macedonia and help us. Come over to Macedonia and help us. Now, after he had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go to Macedonia, concluding that the Lord had called us to preach the gospel to them. Now, I don't suggest that you're going to have a vision. Uh, if you do, you, you better listen to what God tells you. But I don't suggest that you and I are necessarily going to have a vision, but I can tell you that if you stop and you look at the world around you, there are people who are sitting in darkness and they are crying out. They don't know what they're crying out for, but they are crying out for someone to bring them the light that will set them free from the darkness where they're living their entire lives. And there is a call from beyond. You just heard a few moments ago from one of our own missionary partners. We need people. We need people to come join us. We need people to come help us. We need people to give their lives to the cause of the mission. We need people to be a part of helping us to accomplish what God wants to do in this world in carrying the gospel to the end of the earth. There's a call from beyond. I read a story, a missionary story, about an old Chinese man. He lived far inland in China. But he learned about a missionary that was in his province, so he set out on a two-day journey to go find him. He walked from daylight till dusk and then into the night. And late that first night, he fell asleep by a tree on the roadside. Early the next morning, he continued his journey, walking all day. And at nightfall, he felt renewed because he finally found the missionary. And this was the story that he related to the missionary. We of our village have long lived with darkness in our hearts. But we hear that you have come to tell us about a God who can bring us light. Come home with me. It is but a two-day journey across the mountain. We are poor. My neighbors are poor. But all have promised to share with you their rice. We will give you a bed on which to rest and will keep you warm. Beyond us are villages, not just one or two or ten, but hundreds. They too bid you come. The missionary was anguished at heart. He had tears in his eyes as he looked at the man and he said, I can't go now. My body's broken and I'm sick and I'm heading home to get help. And the old Chinese man turned away with deep sadness and he went back into the darkness to wait, to wait. And there are people today who are waiting. Yes, there are some who don't know what they need. They don't understand Jesus or understand why they need Jesus. But there are lots of people as well who know that there's something more that's missing in their lives. And there's a call from beyond. There's a commission from above, a cry from beneath, a compulsion from within, a call from beyond. And there's a crown that's ahead. Paul talks about it in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 17 to 20. He says, But we, brethren, having been taken away from you for a short time in presence, not in heart, endeavored more eagerly to see your face with desire. For what is our hope or joy or crown of rejoicing? Is it not even you in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ that is coming? For you are our glory and joy. Do you hear what he talked about? A crown of rejoicing. A crown was a wreath or a circlet that was worn on the head. It was a symbol of victory or success or high achievement. It was conferred as a mark of honor. It might be something where you think about a gold medal when you, like you earn in the Olympics. And the Apostle Paul says, my crown of rejoicing is when I get to heaven and I see the people who were impacted by my life and impacted by the lives of those that I helped to do the work of God, and I see the faces of those men and women, you will be my crown of rejoicing. There was a musical group, that, Southern Gospel musical group that we've had here a couple of times, and one of the 
uh, singers in the group was v- very prolific and very gifted at being able to write songs. In one of his songs, they've sung here for us a song about faces. I'm not going to try to sing it for you. I don't want the weeping and the wailing in this room. But I want you to listen to the words for just a moment. I dreamed my life was done. I stood before God's Son. It was time to see what my reward would be. With love, he reviewed my life to count what was done for Christ, for that is what will last eternally. See, I'd done my best to share that Jesus really cares, and he would save if they would just believe. Oh, but seldom did harvest come, and so few that I see one, until the Lord said, turn around and see. Then he showed me the faces of the ones who'd come because of me, so many faces that my life had led to Calvary. All those years I thought nobody saw as I labored in lowly places. That's when Jesus smiled and showed me all the faces. He said, though you did not see the yield, you were faithful to plow the field. At other times you helped me plant the seed. No matter how small the task, you did just as I asked. And thanks to you, these souls have been set free. Then he showed me the faces of the ones who'd come because of me. So many faces that my life had led to Calvary. All those years I thought nobody saw as I labored in lowly places. That's when Jesus smiled and showed me all the faces. I don't know exactly what all heaven's going to be like. I read about it in the scripture and I'm excited to be able to go there one day and be a part of what's there. But can you imagine walking the streets of heaven? in meeting those that are there, either because of your direct leading them to Christ or because you participated with others who were sowing the seed or who were watering the seed or who were cultivating the crop or who were harvesting from the the crop as it produced. And there were the faces of those men and women, and they were the crown of rejoicing as you walk through the streets of heaven, just rejoicing that together you were able to be there in the presence of the Savior and be there to be able to worship the one who is deserving of all worship. Thanks for joining us today, and we invite you to come back each Sunday for more messages. If you'd like more information about today's message or Lewis Memorial Baptist Church, feel free to contact us. We'd love to hear how this ministry is helping you in your daily walk.